normally at daylight saving, um, nine o'clock rolls around at this time of the year and everyone comes to church an hour early. But um, we found that everyone came late this morning. <laughs> uh, I don't know whether you guys just don't have it grabbed, grasped the concept of uh, daylight saving, but anyhow, um, maybe you'll get it right next time. Uh, we were prepared for everyone to be here at nine. But anyhow, if you want to uh, bring up the, the, this PowerPoint that I've done, I'm pretty pleased with myself. It took me a long time to get the spelling right. Anyway, we'll bring that up. So uh, last week I spoke a bit about uh, you know, what Jesus said in John 11, 25. I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, they will live. And it's a bit of a, a, bit of a paradox to say that. You know, how do you live and die, like, die and live and all that? But um, Jesus spoke to uh, Martha um, when Lazarus died. And, um, and, and he was talking to Martha and he said to her, um, if you believe... And, and he basically took her from knowing about resurrection to knowing resurrection. Uh, and this is the interesting thing about the Bible, is that G, when Jesus says, I am the resurrection, he's, he's showing us who he is. He's showing us who the Father is. He is the resurrection. He is the, the life. They aren't just words. They aren't just concepts. They are a person. So when we talk about love, God is love. And so we, we sort of understand um, how, you know, what love is, but we've got to know who love is. Love is a person. And so Jesus was resurrected from the dead and the Holy Spirit has been sent to us. The church was established under a new covenant sealed in the blood of Jesus, which is the seal of the king. If, if back in the day you had uh, the, the, the king would give a proclamation or some sort of order and he would stamp his seal on the, on the letter or the piece of paper and fold it over and stamp it so everyone knew that's the king's seal. They knew that it carried all the authority of the king. And... Um, and so, so this covenant has been sealed in the, the blood of Jesus Christ. And the covenant carries with it our king's authority. And God's word is a promise to us and an invitation. An invitation to come and to be with him. Come into, into, into a covenant with him. And he explains it. He fulfills it as he's promised. And being a covenant, the two parties must agree. If you don't come into agreement with the Lord's covenant, you can't really participate in it. It's, it's, quite, it's really impossible. You've got to come into agreement with it. And God's already done his bit by what, you know, Jesus dying on the cross. But we have to do our bit by coming into agreement with it and living in alignment with it. Otherwise, it kind of won't work for you. You know, you are either in the kingdom of this world or you're in the kingdom of God. There is no in between. You're either in one or the other. And, uh, and you know, we flow with the Lord. Here's our flow He's the rivers of living water. We kind of understand that rivers of living water flow out of you, out of us as Christians, but it's also flowing in a way that we need to get into it. You need to get right into it and jump in. When you get baptized, and it comes from a Greek word called baptizo, which is, means to fully immerse. I, one of the best baptisms I've seen, you know, from the beach um, outside the water was when Jack got baptized, and, um, and he got baptized in the surf. And I said to Nat, now when you do this, you face the surf. So you can see what's coming. And, and we just left it, left it up to the Lord to baptise him when he was ready. And, he, and he, I reckon the swell was probably close to a metre, right? It was pretty aggressive. <laughs> and he got baptised. And uh, it was pretty awesome, I have to say. And then we, then we prayed for him you know, on the beach in front of a whole lot of people. And it was really good. But you know, he, he was fully immersed. And we, we baptised Sonny and Tyna uh, last week. And they were fully immersed. We put them right down in the water, fully immersed. And that's what it means. You know, in these rivers of living water, we're fully immersed, but we want rivers of living water to flow out of us. So these things that Jesus has done on the cross have been established already in the Spirit. They are there in the spiritual realm already, because Jesus said, it is finished. And if it's finished, then that means there's not much more us, not many more... Not else, not... Much much more than he can do. Didn't do Olympic exercises this morning. So there's not much more that he can do or that he needs to do. He's actually already done it. It's there in the spiritual realm. And the trick for us, the trick, <laughs> is to, by faith, bring it from heaven, the spiritual realm, into the manifestation in the physical realm. And sometimes that, and that's kind of the battle because it's all about faith. It's all about faith. And, um, 
So we can't see we can't see things in the spirit. It takes faith to see it's done, that it's there and here. You see, if you're if you're working and the Lord says to us, it's a promise, I will bless the work of your hands. And if you don't feel blessed when you're working, either you're thinking that you need to be blessed in a way that's probably not good for you. You know, where's my Lamborghini? If you're thinking in those terms, well, you know, the Lord has got a Lamborghini, but you may not be good for you to have it right now. Or you are in a place where you aren't seeing the 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 blessing that comes from the work of your hand, and you need to say thank you, Lord, that you have done this. And you can begin to command it to happen. And the interesting thing is that when you command it to happen, you are commanding yourself to come into alignment with it as well as commanding it to come from heaven to earth. And it's a it's a really interesting thing. The Bible says that we can only please God through faith. You need faith in Him and belief in Him. And uh, and you need His faith in order to have faith in Him. It's His faith, not ours. So some of our weight with things is actually a faith journey. And we might need to go from unbelief to belief to be able to handle it. And I, I, I spoke last week a bit about um, how you know, I, I realised that there's some things that I just had unbelief around. And, um, and things like, just to be completely open and honest, things like the gospel doesn't really work that well. Now when you believe that, you don't really speak it out. You don't say much about it because it's a bit embarrassed, worried about it not working, whatever it is. So I didn't, I didn't speak it out much. And then, so you have to repent of, because unbelief is a sin. I had to repent of that. Lord, I'm really sorry. Um, with faith and healing, you know, I believe God can and does, but didn't think he would for me. That's unbelief. And I, I, I believe these lies, and therefore, um, that's, you live by those lies. And then the Lord convicted me of, it, of those things, and I realized that I can't come to church with unbelief in my heart about the gospel, about healing. And, and so then started this journey of, well, how do, I, how, do, where, how do I make this work? How does it work, Lord? And part of it is, or the start of it really, is to get your heart right with Him. And instead of looking at me and my goodness and my ability and my righteousness, I've got to look at His. And when I took my eyes off myself and what, my, what I was doing and I looked at Him, you begin to see Him as this righteous, perfect, amazing God who can do anything. It does do anything. He's not the great I am going to be. He is the great I am. And so if he's the great I am, that means he is, it's, it's happening right now, it's happened, it's already done, and we need to pull it from heaven to earth. So it may be a faith journey. Um, unbelief simply won't work with faith. Unbelief says you can't have it here on earth, and heaven won't come to earth for me. So we can't believe this lie. We believe in Jesus. And Jesus, our resurrection... Jesus our life, Jesus our bread of life, Jesus who quenches our thirst, Jesus who is our peace, Jesus our saviour. These things that I've just said, Jesus our saviour, our saviour isn't a thing, it's not just a word or a concept, it's actually a person yeah, it's of Jesus Christ. You believe in him, then he is your saviour, he is saviour. So you go from knowing about these truths to knowing Jesus is truth. And I mentioned last week about Jesus with Lazarus who died and Jesus made sure he was really dead. Because you see, the, the Jews, or the um, Israelites back in those days, they thought the soul hovered around the body for about three days after death. So Jesus didn't go there until the fourth day. So all the, all the Israelites knew he was dead. The soul had gone, all hope was gone. But he was preparing them for his own death and resurrection. And, and so in the future, when Jesus spoke something, he spoke to them, they would know that you could trust him. He spoke about his own death and resurrection, and then when it happened, and he was raised from the dead, they were like, oh, now I see it. So when Jesus speaks to us, you don't have to, um, you don't have to see it before you believe. Um, you know, the, one of the difficulties I was wrestling with this morning was, you know, about the tooth and the jaw thing, was, well, what if nothing happened? And you know what the Lord said to me when I said that to him? What's your message about this morning? You know, I, I need to cover my notes from the Lord so he can't read them. Because he, he, he was cheating, reading the notes. And I, 
But anyway, maybe he doesn't need to look over my shoulder at my notes. But you know, here we have to, here we're supposed to be faced with a situation, and I, and I prayed for quite some time before the meeting, Lord, show me some things, what, what, what do you want me to do, who do you want me to pray for, and all those things, and often God will speak to me beforehand, but today it was like, nah, I'm not doing that today. You know, we'll, we'll see at the time, it's like, man, what? And, and you know, but what are you speaking about? Well, I'm speaking about bringing things from heaven to earth, even though you can't see them. Even though I can't see, taste, hear, smell, and feel them, they're still there in the Spirit. Healing is right there in the Spirit. Salvation is right there in the Spirit. You speak out the gospel message, and the power of God is right there, and it happens. Yeah. And I, 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 you know, that's why I had to repent and say, Lord, I'm so sorry that my, I had unbelief around the gospel message. But of course, it silences you. And I spoke about Zechariah, the, the father of John the Baptist. And he didn't believe what Gabriel, the uh, angel, said to him about having this son. Because he said, oh, we're pretty old. Especially my wife. She's pretty old. And, um, you know, I'm probably all right, Lord, but her. Um, but he, 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 the Gabriel said, You're gonna, you won't be able to speak because you, of your unbelief. And that's what I spoke about, how unbelief, <laughs> unbelief can silence our voice. And, man, I tell you, I tell you this. I believe it, I believe this, that there's a time coming for all of us where we're going to have to speak up. Yeah. We won't be able to remain silent. You will be put in a situation where you will have to say, well, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. And it may cost you something. The time is coming. You know, there's some laws being um, enacted around the world that are, you know, saying that things that are in the Bible are hate speech. And you can go to jail for those things. And so, um, if we think it's not going to arrive here, we're probably kidding ourselves. You know, uh, we need to be prepared and get ready. And I can't, I don't want unbelief to silence my voice when it's time to speak up. We were at a, a meeting with Tom and Sharon at Oranga Tamariki on um, Friday. And they said to us, you can, you can come there as support people, but you can't say anything. You've got to be silent. Now, no problem for me. A Deirdre, whoa, whoa, whoa. And Sharon. And, and Sharon, yeah. And I'm thinking, well, what am I here for? You know, I've got stuff to say, man. But anyway, we were very compliant and very good. Um, but thankfully, um, they said, oh, um, who's going to open in Karakia? And so I closed my eyes. And I realised everyone was looking at me. <laughs> oh, oh, it's me. All right. So, you know, I... I did what probably other people wouldn't have done, and I honoured those people, and I honoured Oranga Tamariki for what they do in this yeah. country. And, and, and I've learned to do this because I know that um, when you go to interventions down at the um, high school, down there, everyone attacks the principal and the board. But with my prayer, I don't, I honour. And, and, and you see, I, didn't, I wasn't able to say anything, but I could pray. And I pray for the... <laughs> That's what I do down at the school of well. I pray for the presence of God to come and fill the room. <laughs> to be amongst us all. <laughs> oh, they didn't know what they were doing. Um, you know, forgive them, Lord, because they didn't know what they were doing. And they got this good old prayer. And um, anyway, but, it, I, but I was a little bit restrained. But it was just a fantastic opportunity that even though we had to remain silent, I still got to pray. And, and I prayed. I felt, oh, well, Lord, you just got to fill my mouth. And I opened my mouth and I began to pray. And it was just, um, it was awesome. If we've received Jesus, we have these things that he has done. You know, that it is finished. We have these things right now, right here. And faith brings them from heaven to earth. Now, I want to just go through some things. There's, there's five things here um, about the foundation, the authority, the commission, the power, and the result. So Jesus establishes his church. And so Matthew 16, 13 to 18 Matthew 16, 13 to 18 says, Now when Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? You know, now, if Jesus went to people and said, Who do you say I am? People would have gone, Oh, they don't say anything about you. Because, you know, they would have been afraid of Jesus to say. But the, they probably spoke to the disciples. Who do people say that I am? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, because he'd been beheaded at that point. And others, Elijah, and still others, Jeremiah, or one of the other prophets. 
And he said to them, but who do you yourselves say that I am? He, he probably wanted to know, is your thinking about me tainted by what the world says about me? And this is what, this is what I mean when I say we're going to have to speak up at some point. We can't trot out what we think the world wants to hear. You can't trot that out. That's not being really faithful to the name of God. You know, we have to say, well, this is the truth. And you might say, they might say, well, that's hate speech. And you go, well, how would you interpret the word of God then? How do you interpret that? You know, and, and we're going to have to speak this out. And it's not really that this is not my opinion. This is what the word of God says. And so that's what we stand on. But who do you yourselves say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And man, we need a revelation of who Jesus is. Eh? Man, we need that. If you don't feel like you have that, you can ask the Lord for it. And I know that he will give it to you, but you might have to seek a bit. You may even have to fast and pray. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. And we can be pretty confident that those words spoken to Peter are for the whole church. You know, if we build what we are building on anything that's not the foundation, the cornerstone, the capstone, which is Jesus Christ, we are building on shifting sand. And you all know what happens when the, the floods come up and the rain comes down and all that sort of stuff, like the song goes, you know, that gets washed away. But, um, you see, Peter knew who Jesus was and he knew that I will build my church, I will do what I'm going to do based on Jesus Christ, the rock of my salvation, the cornerstone, the capstone. If you're a builder, you know very well that you're very, the very starting point is so important. Everything is keyed off that foundation or that cornerstone. You can see whether the lines are true by looking down you know, the, the, from that cornerstone. And if you're, if you're building something of your own, you're building it on shifting sand. But Jesus said to what God has revealed to Peter is that you are building on the rock of your salvation. Really interesting uh, what, uh, what he said there. But it's for all of us. He, it's for all of us. And we are co-heirs with Jesus. He's the firstborn of the new covenant. Peter now had his trust in the rock of our salvation. Now Jesus can build on that. You know, sometimes we wonder why Jesus isn't building anything through us. Well, maybe we've got to go back and ask, are we uh, established on the rock of our salvation? Or is it all about something else? The next one is the authority. The church was given authority. In Matthew 16, 19. I give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And if you, in Revelation, um, and, 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 and that, um, you know, when Jesus gets to heaven, he's given the keys of the kingdom. In other words, all the resources of heaven, um, uh, Jesus got the keys to those. And now he says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Isn't that interesting? So it would pay to know what to bind and what to loose. So, hey, you know, um, I mean, you know, I've, I've heard some interesting stuff. People pray, and I've prayed some interesting stuff myself about binding and loosing. Um, you know, but, but what are you binding? Well, you're binding the work of the enemy. You're binding his demonic spirits from, from doing things. Sometimes we go into a meeting and we're feeling a little bit uneasy. And as we're driving there, we're binding all the demonic spirits that will try and take over that meeting. And it's amazing what happens when you do that. Try it with your boss. Uh, not my, if you're not your boss, not because uh, you know he's 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 a, he's a mighty man. But um, but you know, so you've got to know what to bind because you see we have got to be careful we're not stepping out and beyond the authority that's been given to us. And then what do you loose? Well, the Bible talks about being in a prison, being shackled, being bound. So we loose those. And, and the enemy can bind us up, can bind people up, and sometimes we need to, they, people need help to be loosed. So we loose those things, we loose the bondages around people's lives. Colossians 1, 13 to 14 says, For he rescued us from the domain of darkness, and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. 
So he's rescued us from out of the world, the darkness of the world, and the slavery of the world, and he's transferred us into his kingdom. That must mean we're born into the kingdom of this world, and we need to be saved out of it. Um, Ephesians 1, 22 to 23. And he put all things in subjection under his feet and made him head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. You see, when Jesus proved that he was faithful to the call of God on his life, even to death, when he got to heaven, God rewarded him. And I use that word reservedly, but, but I, I kind of want us to understand how these things work. You see, if Jesus had failed in his mission, um, now this is becoming interesting for us because we're, we're human beings, we're not Jesus Christ, and we may fail at times, but thankfully God ain't looking at our performance. He's looking at Jesus Christ who covers over our sin. And so, so what all we need to do is we get our hearts right with God. And out of that right heart, right things will come. It's quite interesting. You don't have to put those do right things, pull the lever and God pops out, because that's legalism. We, we get our heart right with him, and out of that comes right things. Things that he likes, things that he wants. It's quite amazing how it happens. You know, sometimes we feel like, oh, well, I, I, I just need to pray more. And if I pray an hour a day, boy, I can pull that lever and God will pop out big time. Well, we all know that that's not relationship. That's like going to the casino. <laughs> Ephesians, well, I read that. Um, 1 Peter 2, 9. But you're a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. One of the things that Jesus has paid for on the cross is for us to obtain the mercy of God. That's, that the mercy of God was already there, but Jesus has, has just opened the door for us to receive it. Because today is the day of the Lord's favour. The next one is the commission. The church was given its mission, Mark 16, 15, and he said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to all creation. The one who has believed has, and has been baptised will be saved. The one who has not believed will be condemned, and these signs will accompany those who believe. So baptism, when we baptise people in water, it's just really an outward expression of what's already gone on in your heart. Um, Matthew, and then it then goes on to say, um, and these signs will accompany those who believe. Ooh, pretty exciting. What signs are they? Well, uh, you'll have to read that for yourself. Uh, Matthew 28, 18 to 19. And Jesus came up and spoke to them, saying, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to follow all that I commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Quite a promise. And you know, now we see the problem with unbelief around the gospel. If you have a problem with the gospel, you know, you're afraid to share it, is it an issue with unbelief? And right today, you can choose to repent of that and say, Father, I'm so sorry that I, was, I, I felt like that and I didn't want to share. I was afraid of sharing the gospel because I didn't think it would work. There'd be no power in it. So, I, you know, I love Steve May when he came. No fear. And I'm looking at him singing down at the shops just thinking, my goodness. You know, some Martian has come down here. Doesn't care about what people think, you know. I, 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 and I kind of, you kind of wish you were like that, you know. And then you think to yourself, but he's quite successful at it, so that's why he keeps doing it. Or is it he's successful because he actually does it? <laughs> anyway, I'm still babbling later on. Um, then there's the, then there's the, you know, we, we shouldn't let the silence be silence or silence for our unbelief. And as I said before, there's a day when we're going to need to speak up and not be silent. And that may be a bit that day may be a bit closer than what we think. Then there's the power. The church was given power. Acts 2, 1 to 4. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place, and suddenly a noise like a violent rushing wind came from heaven and it filled the whole house where they were sitting, and tongues that looked like fire appeared to them, distributing themselves, and the tongue rested on each one of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with different tongues as the Spirit was giving them the ability to speak out. Now we didn't see this happen. And I haven't seen it personally. However, sometimes God reveals to us what is going on in the spirit so we can know. And I don't have to see it in the flesh to know that it's still happening today, right now, with all of us. 
we walk around in the spirit with tongues of fire on, on us. You know, we, this is what I mean by having faith, by it's got to come from heaven to earth. We need to believe that we, we have tongues of fire on us. You know, you come into a situation, you go into this meeting with Uranga Tamariki, and the people that are there aren't, you aren't coming under them. Because you're under our Father in heaven, they are coming under the Father. <laughs> you know, they, they are now in the presence of Almighty God because you bring that presence with you. Yeah. And, and that's, the, that's the thing. And sometimes we, what, what is seen as defeat yeah. is actually victory. Is actually victory. How, in the world sense, how can Jesus dying on the cross be victory? Well, you know, what happens in the spirit doesn't often make sense in the flesh. I know that. So do we believe it? Do we believe that this is happening right here, right now, with us all the time? That we have tongues of fire resting on all of us in the spirit? Well, if you don't believe it, it probably won't happen. Probably not, you know, you, you've got to believe it. You've got to have faith in it and trust in the Lord. So sometimes the Lord shows us what's going on in the spirit all the time. Um, but, you know, I, I feel like in the church in New Zealand, one of the big issues we face, one of the biggest issues is unbelief. You know, I, I, I know God can, but I don't think he will. And maybe we've just got too used to, to um, not pushing through, not really going after God, not figuring out, well, because life is pretty easy. You know, like, I don't have to fast because I've got KFC just down the road, hallelujah. And I said to Tom, look, if, if, you're, if you're really good at this meeting with Oranga Tamariki, we'll take you to KFC. I said that. And, fun, and he didn't want to go. But Maya, oh boy, she wanted to go. This was not for you, Maya. But, you know, I, 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 tried to, I tried to bribe him with good stuff, but it didn't work. I needed to bribe him with something else. But, you know, the result of all of this is that the church began accomplishing its mission. In Acts 2.41, then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. You know, if, um, if you're not praying for people, your neighbours, your friends, your family... Um, can I suggest you start? We've been praying for the people that live around here, especially the ones that can hear us on a Sunday morning. <laughs> Some of them have got double glazed windows, but um, you know they don't always leave them shut. But you know, for those people over the road and beside us, um, you know, we pray for those people over the road. We pray for people all over the place, and we believe that God is by His Spirit going to move in their lives. But at some point. We may be called upon to speak it out to them. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. You get your heart right with God, because it's all about a relationship, and you watch the things fall into place and come into his order. It's, it's, really, it's really great. We have a foundation or a cornerstone that is Jesus Christ. We stand on his foundation. It is the Lord who establishes us in the right place so he can build we have been given authority from the Lord to accomplish His will and calling. We have been commissioned to fulfill His plan. He goes before us. He has given us, given us His power to fulfill His plan here on earth. The Holy Spirit flows through us and empowers us with the victory Jesus has won through His birth, death and resurrection that is obedience to our Father. Jesus proved He could be trusted and was given more. I used to think for years that I would make a much better boss than an employee. And I realise that the Word of God doesn't say that. He says, the word of God says, if you can be trusted as an employee to do a good job, you can then be a boss. But the world's way is perverted. It says something else. I deserve, I'm entitled, and whatever. But you see, if we can be trusted in the little thing, we can be trusted with more. If you can be trusted with someone else's stuff, you can be trusted with your own. Whoa. That's different to the world's way. So, we have been given the results, when we have the results of all of this stuff, when we see people born again, saved and set free in Jesus' name, that's the results of it. Now the church has a number of functions that I'm listing, it's not all of them, but this is the, the main ones that I've got here today. It's the bride of Christ, Christ's body, God's temple, the family. So we are the bride of Christ, so that means he's the groom. And now you get an understanding of what it means to have a relationship with him, how he sees things. Um, we are Christ's body, we're his hands and his feet. We now do the work that Jesus did on earth. We are God's temple. We carry the presence of God in us. We are his family. 
And the Lord has designed the church for what is best for us to see the results of preaching the good news, building the church that is encouraging each other, sharpening each other, standing strong together as Christ's body. Jesus is the groom, we are his bride. And as I said before, and I wanted to repeat it, this shows how our relationship is seen in the Lord's eyes. So that means that faithfulness, honesty, truth, love and satisfaction, etc. are vital parts of this relationship. They're important to the Lord, so they should be important to us. We are Christ's body, as hands and his feet here on earth, as representatives to share and to show who the Lord is. We're, we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We carry his presence. We carry his authority and the message of his word. We are ambassadors. We've been given his word and we take it out to the place that he's called us to. We are grafted into the true vine. Um, that means that, you know, um, you know how you graft a vine? You graft a with grapes and your stuff, you graft them on and you cut a V and you put it in and you wrap it. And now all of the nutrient, all of everything that that grape needs comes from the rootstock or the vine. And that's Jesus Christ. And we aren't any longer in slavery to this world's systems and institutions. Because I tell you where they're heading. They're heading on a negative death spiral. If you choose to go and follow them, well, you're going you're gonna to reap that as a harvest and you know we take on his name now if I if if let's say a your daughter married someone called Trump just look at a few all the faces and the expression now you may not particularly like their decision to marry a Trump but is it was it the person that's the problem or is it the surname and everywhere you went people would say you're not related to Donald Trump, are you? Well, yeah, I married his son. Oh, or whatever you think. You know, but that, that name carries all sorts of things in people's minds. Good, bad, and ugly. So does Gates. So does, so does Zuckerberg. We all know these names, but you don't really know them. You just know the name and the reputation. Or what the media portrays or whatever. But you, you know, you want to get to know. But we carry the name of our father. What does that mean to people? Well, we might have to explain what it means to people, but we should be very excited about carrying our Father's name. We can't remain silent. A, as the saying goes, preach the gospel at all times, talk if necessary. If a picture says a thousand words, how many words will our actions say? We are to live by faith that is opposite, that is the opposite of unbelief. So being part of the church, and I'll just wrap, um, whiz through this quickly. Being planted... There's church order and authority contributing. And so being planted. I spoke before about, you know, God establishes it, but we need to be planted in the church, in the place where God has called us to. Acts 2, 46 to 47. Everyone kept feeling a sense of awe, and many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all the believers were together and had all things in common, and they would sell their property and possessions and share them with all to the extent that anyone had need. Day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favour with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. That's being planted. You are planted in the body of Christ. So there's a church order and authority. The early church devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching in Acts 2.42. They had fivefold leadership and people followed the instructions of the apostles. Now the apostles were seen in those days as people that were eyewitnesses of Jesus. Seeing and being with him. Seeing him, that's what an apostle was seen as back then. Operating with order and unity. And you know, we can still access this teaching through the New Testament of the Bible today. That's the good news. That fivefold stuff, you, you can still get that. This is where messages come from. <laughs> it's the, the word of God. You know, the, the, that fivefold teaching that, that why witnesses, and this is the amazing thing about the Word of God, is it still stands the test of time today. You know, what Jesus did way back then, the apostles were eyewitnesses to it. They wrote about it, they talked about it, they taught people about it, those who hadn't seen or didn't believe at the time, and it's still continuing on in its power today. Isn't it amazing that it does that? Is there any, any, other, any other person's teaching that, that has done that? It stands the test of time. It still is relevant today. You can, it can't come under all sorts of scrutiny and it still stands up. And, and as they say, science every day catches up with the Word of God. Every day it catches up. It's like, oh, I knew that. You know? 
Didn't have to tell me. But anyway, they try and tell you, as if it's a big new thing. Then there's the con contributing. The believers understood the importance of the contributing through being generous in their lifestyles. Acts 2, 40 to 47, and I won't read it out, but it talks about tithing, fellowship, communion, prayer, giving, and caring for others. And if we try to apply worldly thinking to these spiritual things, it's going to go bad. Because the world just cannot understand how this works because it's spiritual stuff. It doesn't make sense to a worldly mind that hasn't been renewed yet. A mind that isn't the mind of Christ. These are spiritual principles that are accessed through faith in the goodness of God. In other words, we see them in the spirit and by faith bring them into the physical realm so we can see them here on earth. And this is, the, this is one of the most difficult things for a Christian, is believing, because especially in the Western world, do we really need God? Someone said, if you can do without more of God, you will. If you can do without healing because you can go and get something from a doctor or whatever, you might do that. But you know, there's something about putting your trust in God and saying, Father, what do you say? And I'm not saying that going to a doctor is wrong. I'm not saying that at all in medication. I'm not saying surgery and all those things. I've had, I've had plenty of surgery in my life with stuff. But, you know, first we put our trust in him. First. And then we say, Lord, what do you say? There's nothing like getting the word of God on things. Hebrews 1, 1 to 4 says, Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for. That's the title of deed. And it's divinely guaranteed. See how it's a title deed? You, a title, if you have the title deed of a property, you already have it. It's a, one of the cool things. And the evidence of things not seen. I believe them even though I can't see them. The conviction of their reality. For by this the men of faith of old gained approval. By faith that is with an inherent trust and endurance confidence in the power, wisdom and goodness of God, we understand that the worlds of the universe and the ages were framed and created, formed, put together and equipped for their intended purpose by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things which are visible. Now this was written a long time ago, and it's only recently that they've worked out in science that, th you know, things that we can see are made up of tiny little things you can't see. You know, God knew, all the Christians, like, yeah bro, know that, didn't need a microscope. Um... By faith, Abel offered to God a more acceptable offer, a sacrifice than Cain, through which it was testified of him that he was righteous, upright and right standing with God, and God testified by accepting his gifts, and though he died, yet through his act of faith he still speaks. So faith is eternal. It keeps going. The faith that you have today will continue on. It doesn't just stop. It keeps going. Selfishness and withholding is the world's way, unless you are bribing someone then you seem really generous. You know, what are you giving them money for? Ah, oh, because I'm generous. <laughs> the blessing of the Lord comes through obedience to Him. And if you're not sure about some stuff, ask Him. There's nothing like getting the Word of God on for stuff, eh? Nothing like it. If you have problems with faith in something, you get God's Word on it. I'll tell you what, um, you don't have a problem with faith anymore. Getting things done in the order that God chooses is the way to go. You know, I can look at someone's life and think, oh, well, if you put this there and you do that like this, things will go better for you. And God's going, ho, 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 You think you know, do you? Oh, yeah, I, think, I thought I did. Well, you don't. And so, so God, you know, God looks at it like a, this onion and you need to peel back the layers in order to get to the root of the problem. But sometimes we want to peel off the wrong things. And, and it can muck people's lives, it can muck your own life up. But you know, what does the Lord say? What's God saying to do? Chaos is the way of the world, disorder, division and disunity comes with torment. The sin of the world's way leads to death, whereas the way of the Lord, the way of the word of God leads to life, an abundant life of that. Now notice those, there's two, there's two um, in there, the two lots of leads. So the way of the world, sin which leads to death, isn't just a sudden death, it's actually a slow death. Slowly you're on this negative death spiral. Slowly you have a terminal illness that's heading in the wrong direction. It's regressive. But the word of God, following God's way, is progressive. It's spiraling up. And this is the thing, you're not, you don't just suddenly die, you know, in, in your sin. It's a slow 
process. And the reason it's slow is actually God's mercy because he's giving us time to change our minds. Isn't that good of him? One time, you know, we're, we're just walking through life, tiptoeing through the tulips, you know, box of fluffy ducks and beer and skittles and all the rest of it. And suddenly we have some bad stuff happen and, and, um, and we go, oh, and we cry out to God. He's there to listen. He's there to listen. It's eternal life is progressive. We may struggle with coming into alignment with the Lord's way. There may be many tears and some sleepless nights as we are uncoupled or separated from reliance on people, money, jobs, bosses, the government, or who, or whatever. Or oh, it's hard, eh? You know, when I, when I decided to go on for God, I, had to, I just dropped the people that I was hanging out with because they were a bad influence. Or was I a bad influence on them? I can't remember. Um, maybe it went both ways. But, you know, I, I had to uncouple and separate myself from them and die to that, let that die, in order to take on the new that God had for me. And I'm very pleased that I did. There are times when we must speak up, times where we must get up, times where we must not give up, times where we must look at the cost and count up, times where we must stay calm and listen to a still small voice that comes from us. Mark 11.22, Jesus said, have faith in God. It literally means to have the faith of God, to have the God kind of faith that brings heaven to earth. And, and if you need something from the Lord, you go to him and you speak to him about it. Spend some time. Ask him. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness and be prepared for him to speak to you. Because that if you, if you don't think he's going to speak to you, you may have some unbelief around that. And that's going to restrict you hearing from him because... You see, the lie is that God doesn't speak to me. So how are you ever going to hear if you don't believe he speaks to you? So you, need, you may need to make yourself believe it. I command myself to believe the word of God. It's that kind of stuff. And it's good. You're actually commanding yourself to come into alignment with it. You command yourself. Because you see, my old self don't want to. It's not spiritual. It wants to be in charge. But I, I, I want to live in the spirit. Let me pray. Father, we just want to thank you for today. I thank you that your, your word, just as I said before, stands the test of time. You know, it's always relevant. Because it's about human nature and how you've redeemed that human nature. And human nature hasn't changed for thousands of years. And Lord, we just thank you that we haven't reached that point. The Bible talks about it as, as in the days of Noah. We obviously haven't quite reached that point yet. I don't know how bad it was then. For you to send this flood and to say that's it. But Lord, we are so thankful for your mercy and your grace on us. And I pray, Lord, that as we as we think about this word that we've received this morning, I pray, Lord, that you would help us, Father, to, to uncouple from any unbelief, uncouple or separate from all the things we need to in order to go on for you. Because I don't want to be chained and bound up to things that are preventing me from moving forward in you. I pray, Father, that if we believe a lie, that the gospel doesn't work or that you won't speak to us, I pray that you would help us to, you know, reveal it to us, that you would help us to repent, say we're sorry, Father, and, and, and choose to put that down, to kill it off, to let it go, and to take on and believe God. And you, and the other lie might be, well, I don't deserve it, and you don't. But Lord, I thank you, Father, that Jesus Christ deserves it, and we take on his record. You see him when you look at us. And so that's why we want to stay in alignment with him. Because in alignment with him, we are covered. Our sins are covered over. And we are in right standing with you.